Hello, my name is Steve Jameson. I go by the painting and brush name of Woden, W-O-D-I-N. That's a Viking word that means fearless warrior that I chose in my youth to help me be more courageous. Uh, tonight, I thought I would tell a few Baba dreams that I can remember having over the years. I've had very many. So we'll see what few I can remember. Um, here's a sweet one I think we can start with. Um, I dreamt I was in elementary school, maybe about second or third grade. And uh, I went to an all Catholic school taught by mostly nuns in Kentucky in the, mm, I guess in the early 1960s. And um, it was a beautiful old building with wooden floors, two stories high, really big high windows with long beautiful window shades to keep the sun out. Um, we didn't have air conditioning then. So sometimes the windows would be wide open and you hear the birds singing, see the leaves turning brown in the autumn. Um, those were very sweet times. And uh, this dream was in that building. Um, there was a big class of children. And um, occasionally, once or twice a year, we had a... Um, supervisor nun come to supervise our teacher. Now our teachers, all of our nuns wore black habits with a little white trim in the front, but the supervisor wore this really beautiful ivory colored habit. She was long and tall and slender and wore beautiful cologne. Sometimes the nuns had such beautiful cologne that smelled like flowers. And uh, it was always nice when one of them leaned over you to help you with your work and you could smell how sweet her habit was as it fell over you and how gentle and feminine she was. So in my dream, uh, Mara was the nun wearing the ivory white robes. Um, Mara was the closest female disciple of my spiritual master, Meher Baba. The closest female disciple. And uh, he had told us that she was the purest soul in the universe. He also once said that he could not breathe without her. So in this dream, we were second or third grade children and it was art class. Art class was always my favorite because that's the one I was best at. I was better than all the other kids. And it was usually Friday afternoon at the very end of the week, kind of like dessert. You get to work hard all week and then Friday afternoon art class and then go home for the weekend. And I always loved art class. And anything creative intrigued me. So Mara was teaching art class in this dream. Now, in those days, the teachers would draw a silhouette or outline drawing to be colored in, and they would copy it on what was called a mimeograph machine. Uh, the paper wasn't very easy to color on. It was kind of waxy and didn't receive the crayons very well. But that was the paper we had, and um, the outlines were kind of a purple color. It was called mimeograph. That was before photocopy machines. So the nuns would prepare those in the office and be ready for art class. Uh, so Mara had done this and um, she had taken a piece of paper and drawn six little fish on it. And there was the outline of the fish and there was skinny fish and fat fish, round fish and slender fish. Some had stripes, some had polka dots, all different patterns. And she had taken the first one, her sample, and colored it herself and showed us an example of what it could look like before we colored our copies. 
And I can't tell you how beautiful hers was. It was simple and childlike, but she didn't get out of line with the crayons. She colored very soft and solid colors. And then around the edge of each drawing, the color of the crayon got a little bit darker, so it looked shaded and rounded, dimensional. Um, it, it was done with such um, love and peace and gentleness and care to be beautiful. I was just in awe of how she had colored her little fish. And so she had about 50 copies of these to hand out to all the kids in the classroom with instructions that we were to color our fish like hers or whatever colors they wanted, but color them. So that, oh, I also, I remember she walked up and down the aisles between us to supervise and watch what we were doing. And her perfume smelled like roses. It smelled wonderful as she walked by. And sometimes the edge of her garment would touch you very lightly and it felt delightful. Um, I think that might be the end of the dream, but one important thing was what I felt like it meant when I woke up the next morning. Um, I felt like the lesson of the dream was that she was telling us that when we're with Meher Baba, the avatar, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, when we're the, with the avatar, we don't need to understand the universe. We don't need to go through the planes of consciousness um, and become conscious of all the different planes. Here we are on the gross plane, which is where most of us humans live. We don't need to understand the subtle, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to the seventh plane. We don't need to understand the laws of the universe. We don't need to understand how to progress spiritually. All we need to do is color our fish well and just do a good job with your life and do it beautifully, harmoniously, happily, and that's all we need to do. And the avatar will take us to our destination of Godhood. We don't need to study any spiritual books. We don't need to learn anything. We don't need to understand anything. It's very, very, very simple. So that was a very sweet and beautiful little dream. Um, one other one that comes to my mind now. Um, In this dream, Meher Baba was touring England with his female Mondali, that's his disciples. Uh, there was only a few of them with him. There was Mera, his little sister Mani, and maybe Dr. Gohair, maybe Meru, uh, some of his closest female disciples. They were touring with him around England and I was part of the family. I was part of the group. And um, there may have been men traveling also, but if there were, they weren't necessarily in the stream and maybe they were staying in separate hotel rooms. Um, but I was a member of the family. I was like a nephew and I felt very much loved by all the women, like they were my aunts. And um, I was allowed to stay in the same suite of these British hotels with Mayor Baba and the women. I had Baba and I slept in one bedroom and the women in other bedrooms, but I was allowed to stay in the suite with them. And I think it was partly because I was considered like a nephew, a member of the family, and partly because I'm gay, a heterosexual man probably would not have been invited to be there, but I could be around the women comfortably. And um, I remember we were in this uh, old Tudor style hotel, um, 
very beautiful old historic building, several hundred years old, with um, dark oak panel walls interior. Um, I remember uh, I was alone at one point downstairs and there were glass cabinets with beautiful china. I especially remember seeing beautiful uh, china teacups in these glass cabinets. And uh, I went upstairs to our suite where we were all staying. It was a big open suite with a huge big room in the middle for everyone to congregate and then bedrooms off the sides. And uh, when I walked in to the great room, um, right in front of me was a very tall, like three story tall, Tudor glass window, like you would see in an English castle, and beautiful sunlight coming in. And in front of the window, Meher Baba was sitting on a, I guess it's called a chase lounge. It's like a, like a couch, or like a bed that has an arm on one side. And um, when the evening came, Baba and I went to one bedroom that was for he and I, and the women went to there on the other side. Um, the main feeling I got from that dream was it really made me feel like I was part of the family. I really did feel like a nephew with all these loving aunties. And one of the benefits from that dream is that not long after that, Meher Baba's sister, Mani, contacted me and asked that I illustrate a book that she had written of her stories from her childhood with Meher Baba. Later, I did another book for her of her dreams of Meher Baba. And I consider that invitation from her to be probably the biggest boon to my art career in my life. Um, um, I guess I could say I consider myself a world-class artist. I have won dozens of national level art awards but I'm not famous as an artist other than maybe among a few members of the Baba community. And I guess a person needs to have the right karma or the right lucky breaks to meet the right people, to be presented to the world, to become known. Um, but I don't care about that world very much. Uh, Mayor Baba and his Mondali are the world that I care about and feel comfortable with. And so to have, um, to have Mani invite me to illustrate her book was in this lifetime, the biggest jump up for my art career. Um, amazing to me, I'm very appreciative of it. But I wasn't overwhelmed like you might think I might be when I got the invitation because I already felt like I was a member of the family. It felt natural. Uh, it, it wasn't too psychologically or emotionally overwhelming when I got that invitation. Um, And that's making me think of another story related to Moni and her book publishing that I can tell. This is not, this is not a dream. Uh, it's real life adventure, but it's related to Baba's sister Moni and to um, her children's books, that she, children's stories that she wrote. Um, so this story goes, um, 
I had always been a fan of highly illustrated, very elegant, hardcover children's books and wanted to be part of that. And then when I illustrated two books for Monty, that jump-started my book illustration career. Then there was a fellow who was um, taking poetry from the from Hafiz, who was a, a 12th century Persian saint, Sufi saint. And this fellow in the Meher Baba community was reading those poems and then not exactly translating them, but through inspiration, uh, writing poems with a similar message in modern American English. And I love his poems more than any other poet I've ever known. And he became uh, the top selling poet in the world on Amazon Books. So, um, one day I was at a friend's house visiting one evening and I saw one of his poetry books of modern day English versions of Hafiz in my friend's house. And I thought that man should be very proud of himself that, um, He's accomplished something in the world, and it's a, a beautiful thing that he's done here. Uh, it seems like so many people in the Mayor Baba community are very much in touch with the Avatar and are blessed to have a relationship with him, but don't necessarily have worldly success in career. So I thought he, he should be proud of himself. I was impressed and I thought I need to read his books and I hadn't read one yet. But I did read them and I loved them. And then not long after that, he just out of the blue walked into my art studio sign shop in North Myrtle Beach and um, said to me that he was the top selling poet in the world. And he asked his publisher what more he might be able to do and the publisher had suggested that he do children's poetry books so he came and asked if I would illustrate them for him and I suspect he got the idea because he had seen my illustrations for Monty um, so that's probably why he chose me out of all the artists who illustrate Mayor Baba's figure I'm guessing. So yeah, I really wanted to do this. And I was gonna do my pictures of Mayor Baba combined with his Hafiz poetry. And um, then the problem came. Uh, he had some of the top publishers in the world. I think he was working with publishers like Viking and Penguin. And we submitted our book design and these publishers said, oh, it's a beautiful book, we really wish you well, but it's politically incorrect to speak about God to children. It's not politically accepted in America at this time. So we don't want that fight on our hands. We don't want that battle, but good luck with that. We wish you well. So then what to do? Um, I got a book on how to become a children's book publisher and it suggested uh, that I every month take one of my illustrations and put it on a postcard with a sample poem on the other side and mail this to all the children's book publishers in North America. And I think there were about 250 in, in all of North America and Canada. And um, I was doing that for about two years and it was costing me several thousand dollars to do this. And I even created a website with samples of what the artwork would be in the book. So the publishers could look at that. 
and that cost several thousand dollars back when the internet was new and not very many people knew how to build a website and it was very expensive to do that. So a couple of years had gone by and no nibbles. And um, one morning I was riding my exercise bike and watching the morning news before I go to work. And uh, suddenly I realized it is August 19th. And that was the day, the anniversary of the day that Monty had gone to live with Baba in spirit. She had left her body. And um, while I was riding the bike, I heard a man's voice. It felt like Mayor Baba. It was Mayor Baba. It was God's voice. And he said in my ear, Steve, this would be a really good day to ask Monty for a gift since this is her day. And uh, I thought, well, what would Monty like to give me? And I thought she and I had worked on two books together oriented towards children's illustrations and stories. And um, Monty and I both shared um, a childlike nature. And um, in fact, a, um, a very famous psychic shaman once told me that I had fairies in my ears, which is why I am so childlike and, and mischievous in my artwork. And then I thought, well, maybe that's why I feel so close to Baba's sister, Monty, because she seems to have fairies in her ears too. So anyway, I was wondering what would, what would Monty like to give to me? And what can she give to me now that she's in spirit form? Baba told us that she has one more incarnation to live and she will be a man and she will be a perfect master. So I wonder if she'll be here in my lifetime and if I'll meet her. That'll be amazing. So I'm thinking, what would she like? And I thought, well, we both like children's books. So I've been trying to get this children's book of Hafiz poetry into the world for two years, and I'm not getting anywhere with it. So I said, Monty, um, have a book publisher contact me so that we can, we can publish this children's book. And I remembered in a story that she had written in one of her books that I illustrated, she said that with Mayor Baba, you have to be a lawyer. You have to spell out exactly the details of what it is you want to get it just right. And so I said, if we're gonna have a miracle, if you're gonna bring a publisher into my life, then make it be today. Bring me a publisher today, and by the end of the day, let's have a contract for this children's book. And then I forgot all about my request because you see, it wasn't my idea. It wasn't, it wasn't my idea to ask her for this. I felt like God spoke to me in this year and then it went out that year and I let go of it. I had no attachment to it. I just did what God told me to do. I went to work that day, went through my busy day with all my employees and, and customers. And about five o'clock at the end of the day, I thought, you know what, I haven't, checked my answering machine today. I need to check it and see if there's any messages. And uh, so on the answering machine, uh, a man said, um, Steve, um, I own a publishing company in uh, Washington State, and we only produce children's spiritually oriented books, no particular denomination or religion, only hardbound books, only full color books, and only award-winning books really beautiful spiritual books for children. And we have been receiving your postcards for several years. And my board and I have decided we want to offer you a contract to do a book. Um, that was pretty amazing. 
after what had happened that morning. That was one of the many miracles that happened in my life. And um, so we progressed with that. We had a contract between the publisher, the author, and me, the illustrator. And a few months were going by. We were working on this project. And um, then, wait, then a few months later, that was August 19th. A few months later, it was December, I'm not sure about day, 5th, 7th, something early December. And um, it was Monty's birthday. And again, it was in the morning and I was watching the morning news before I went to work. And I said, I'm gonna stop and thank Monty for the gift that she gave me last time I spoke with her. She brought me the book publisher. So I stopped what I was doing and I meditated on Monty and thanked her and told her how much I appreciated the contact that she had given me this publisher. And while I'm meditating and thinking of her, I hear a little ding sound and it's my laptop and an email has arrived. So I'm curious to see who it's from, what this is. So I reach over and open the email on my laptop and it's my book publisher in Washington State. And he said, um, Steve, um, we've just barely gotten started uh, on uh, your book. And in fact, it took me two or three years full time to do the illustrations for this book. Uh, I even had to hire staff to do my sign work so that I could devote time to all these elaborate illustrations. So we were only getting started because I think it took three, two or three years to illustrate them and only a few months had gone by. So we were just in the beginning stages and getting sketches approved. And so I get an email from my publisher and he said, well, we already know that we're gonna love this book very much. And we only publish one or two books a year. We're a small company. And we've decided we would like to offer you a contract for a second book before the first one was even halfway done. And again, on Monty's birthday. So it really felt like Monty was helping me with my children's book illustrations. Um, let me see, have I told everything in that story? That's all I can think of about that story for now. Now let's see if I have any any more dreams written down here to talk about? Hmm. Um, this, okay, I'll talk about the empty cups. Um, I was in my early 20s and just finding out about Meher Baba, I, I first came to Baba when I was 22 years old in 1975. So at the time, I had a job delivering newspapers in the mornings and it was in Lexington, Kentucky. In the winter time, we would have a lot of snow and it would be very cold, very cold. And I would have to get up about four o'clock every morning, seven days a week for years no break and um, while I'm riding around uh, delivering these newspapers all alone in the morning if it was a snowy morning there was such a beautiful feeling of peace being the only one awake before anyone else was awake um, and the quietness of the snow it's amazing how quiet it can be when there's snow and um, I would love to smell, people were beginning to wake up and fix breakfast. I could smell coffee and bacon uh, being fixed for breakfast. It smelled delicious. And it was felt like a very special time to be up alone and in the snow. It was, it was so elegant and peaceful. And um, I started to have 
visions while I was delivering the papers in the snow for several months, I started having visions of cups, empty teacups sitting in the snow. Uh, I don't know why, it just popped in my mind. And I would even have dreams at night of these cups. And sometimes I would have dreams of finding beautiful pieces of broken pottery. Uh, they call it pot shirts, I think. Um, little pieces of beautiful pottery uh, with different colors of glaze and patterns on them. Um, and I would have dreams that it was nighttime and the soil was very black and fertile. And I would be digging through the nice soft black dirt with my fingers and find all these beautiful pieces of broken pottery. And I just would be so overwhelmed with excitement with each one that I found. And so in real life, outside the dream, I started collecting broken pieces of pottery and putting them in the soil of potted plants. So all my potted plants in the house on all the windowsills were loaded up with broken pieces of beautiful pottery. And um, I started to think that it seemed to me that these broken pieces of pottery were like broken pieces of people's hearts and beautiful souls that were all broken apart in life because life is so hard and full of so many disasters and heartbreaks that we're all like pieces of beautiful broken pottery. And that's who we are. And that's how I felt about my love for these broken pieces of pottery. So at one point I started drawing, doing paintings, pastel drawings and paintings of big, big paintings of a big cup with the interior would be glowing from inside, like opalescent inside, and then a snowdrift, and all these bright colored stars in a deep cobalt blue sky. And I did a whole series of those. I didn't know why, I only knew I felt like it and wanted to, but I didn't know why. And at that time, one of my friends, who was one of the people who told me about Meher Baba, uh, we were sitting on my bed one evening, chatting as we laid back on the bed. And I was looking at one of those paintings of the cups on the wall. And I said to her, it just looks like it's pregnant. It looks like it's screaming with silence. And it's so pregnant, like it's waiting for something. That's all I know. That's how it feels. For what? I don't know. And then, over the next few weeks and months, I visited the Mayor Baba Center for the first time, and I started to have dreams about Mayor Baba and visions and coincidences, and I started to accept Mayor Baba as the reincarnation of Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, the Avatar. And it suddenly occurred to me when I wanted to do my very first piece of artwork of Mayor Baba, pastel chalk. Um, I, I don't know why. It occurred to me to put him in the cup. And so I'm gonna show you um, here in this video a picture of that piece of artwork. Um, I didn't know why I was doing it. I was just following my intuition. So, here I have this piece of artwork of Mayor Baba sitting in a cup in a snowdrift with an icy lake or ocean, frozen ocean, and stars in the sky. And the inside of the cup is glowing with light and, and life and very uh, like uh, opalescent or like, um, like the inside of a shell. Um, uh, oyster colors 
So, I guess it was over the next few months or years, sometime after that, uh, in the Mayor Baba community, I started hearing songs and poems by Hafiz, a 12th century Persian poet, a Sufi poet in the um, Muslim community. He was Mayor Baba's favorite poet, I heard. And in many of his poems, he talked about a tavern with an innkeeper who served wine and wine is forbidden in most of Islam, all alcohol drinks. But this friend who owns the tavern dispenses this wine. And the symbolism is that the human heart once it is clean of all desires, is empty and ready to receive the wine of God's love. And he was controversial in his time. So to disguise his real meaning in his poems, he wanted people to think that he was not such a noteworthy character writing poems about alcoholic drinks, but really he was talking about God's love in the, in the um, wine cup, wine glass. So I thought, that's what I've done. I've put God in an empty cup um, without even realizing that I was using the same symbolism that Sufi poets from hundreds of years ago were using. So my intuition had picked up on the symbolism of that without me even understanding why I was doing it. Um, then at, at one point I saw a quote from Mayor Baba where he named several points of ways to see God. And I don't remember them specifically, but I think one of them said, if your heart or mind, I don't remember, is as quiet as a still mountain lake, then you will see God. And there I had drawn the frozen ocean. It can't get more still than that, reflecting the stars on the glassy ice. Um, now, I've told the story of Monty and the publisher, and now the cups. What shall we talk about next? Let's see. I think there's there's one more one more set of dreams I can talk about tonight. Um, when I first was coming to Mayor Baba through dreams and hearing about him through my friends and visiting the Mayor Baba Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in 1975 when I'm 22 years old, um, at that time, one of my jobs was making and decorating wedding cakes. Um, I loved wedding cake decorations and I learned how to do that. And I was doing it for some friends. And when I, when I came to Mayor Baba, um, I was kind of um, mental. Uh, in my late teenage years, uh, I was trying to understand and figure things out a lot. I was a little bit isolated from other people. Um, I wasn't really living in my heart. I was a really sweet little boy when I was little, and I was always a sweet, good person, but I got very mental. Um, when I was, when I was little, I used to actually 
the statues in the Catholic Church and the paintings of the saints and all seemed to come alive to me. I would have visions in church that I felt like I was really there with Jesus and the apostles. I felt like they were walking among us. And I had a lot of love and reverence for Jesus and the apostles. But when I was 12 years old, I decided that the Pope doesn't know any more about God than me. He's no closer to God than me. Um, he, I don't need to listen to anything he says. I can talk to God personally. That was kind of radical at that time in the 1960s for a 12 year old to think that. I'm impressed. Maybe it was from previous incarnations. But during my teenage years, the mistake I made when I felt like I didn't really care to be part of the Catholic Church anymore, not that there's anything wrong with the Catholic Church, but I'm not a group kind of person very much. And I have lots of varied interests and wanted to explore spirituality deeper than that. And, um, and so I separated from the Catholic Church but I made the mistake of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I didn't understand that I could still love Jesus and not be closely connected to the Catholic Church. When I came to Mayor Baba, when I was 22 years old, and I knew that Baba was the reincarnation of Jesus, then all that love flooded back in. Now, what am I talking about? What is this story about? I get lost. Let's see. Um, oh, yes. I just glanced at my notes, I remember. So I was making wedding cakes at that time when I first heard of Baba. So the, the, the love that was awakened in me when I first came to Baba was extremely overwhelming. It was very, very, very intense, all this love from God flowing through me especially after going through several dry spell years in my later teens. And every night I would have a dream of a wedding cake. And I would dream that there was different people getting married. One night there might be two people getting married and there would be a very beautiful two person wedding cake. And then the next night there might be four people getting married and then there'd be a beautiful four person wedding cake. Uh, one night there might be 50 people getting married to each other. There'd be a big, glorious 50-person wedding cake, so beautiful. Sometimes there might be a thousand people getting married. It was this feeling of being unified with all of humanity after my dry spell of my teen years and my mental states. Um, now I was so much in the heart. I felt so connected with all of humanity and I was so happy. Um, and being an artist and a designer, I couldn't wait to go to bed every night and see how beautiful the wedding cake was going to be in my dreams. Very beautiful wedding cakes. And along that same line, um, I was so, my heart was so strongly awakened by Mayor Baba's love that a very strange thing happened. I started to crave humiliation. Now, earlier than that, any type of humiliation would have mortified me. I was an introverted, shy person to begin with. So any kind of humiliation or any idea that I was less than perfect or less than the best little good boy there was would just mortify my ego. But the taste of humiliation made me feel connected to everyone and very humble uh, and not distancing myself from anyone at all. So it was the strangest thing. I've never heard anybody speak about this before, but for very, very many months, maybe a year or more, I could not get enough humiliation. I was 
I was just ravenously thirsty for it. It felt so good to go through humiliation and feel my ego washing away and feel one with everybody. So we've gone through several dreams and almost dreams tonight. I think that's enough for now. Um, I have many, many more. I've written them down at notes. I've got, I can pull out and read more in the upcoming weeks. Um, after the end of this talk tonight, there will be a little video, five or 10 minute video, um, discussing my creative projects, the Daddy God Art Museum, um, the uh, animated movies I want to make of Mayor Baba. And um, if you haven't seen that before, you might like to stick around after the end of this session and hear uh, more information about what I'm doing and ways in which I need people to help me with that. All right, I hope you enjoyed it and um, I will tell more stories in the future. And I'm thinking I might like to develop my skills as an interviewer and interview other people to hear their stories too so we can have all different flavors and all different kinds. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. Hello, my name is Steve Jameson. The brush and pen name of Woden I use for my paintings and stories of my spiritual master, Maker Baba. I hope you enjoyed the video presentation. I plan to create many, many more. So come back from time to time to hear more true life stories of Maker Baba. I also plan to interview others who have had personal Baba experiences and people who follow other spiritual masters such as Jesus, Muhammad and Buddha. I would like to take this time to give you more information on my work. I have a website entitled daddygodartstudio.com. On this website, you can find art prints of my Mayor Baba paintings in a very wide range of sizes and prices. There are greeting cards available and my short story books and art books can be purchased there. I also want to tell you about the planned Daddy God Art Museum. I'm very excited about this project. My main and biggest project for the rest of my life is to build this Daddy God Art Museum to house all my paintings of Mayor Baba after I pass on. Here I want to show you some architectural renderings of the planned museum. You can see the main entrance hall that will greet visitors when they first arrive. Here is the art studio where I can paint edit videos, work on book publishing, and my staff of animators can create. Here's the main common area, a living room-like area, the upper mezzanine with all the paintings of Mayor Baba on the walls, the veranda where people can enjoy the outdoors, kitchen, and dining area. The architectural plan is for a traditional South Carolina low country style of a large home that will house the paintings and can be used for public gatherings and possibly even overnight stays. You see, I was an architect major in college. I love architecture. So I plan to enjoy many years designing and building this museum. My vision for the Daddy God Art Museum is for future visitors of pilgrims to this area of the South Carolina coast in the next few hundred years to have a place to stop for a couple of hours to refresh and be inspired by paintings of Mayor Baba. We now have four places in this area that attract those interested in learning more about Mayor Baba. Foremost, we have the Mayher Spiritual Center founded for Mayor Baba, where people can stay on retreat and attend programs of movies and speakers on Mayor Baba. This center was dedicated and built for Mayor Baba, who visited it three times in the 1950s. 
Right across the street from the center is a bookstore selling all books regarding Maribyrnong. About 45 minutes south of the center, there's the world famous Brookery Sculpture and Horticulture Gardens where people can walk in the path of Mayor Baba, who visited there one day himself. There is Yopan Dunes. This is the house where Mayor Baba stayed for some time while he was recuperating from a car accident. He had a, um, a painful car accident in America that he said was his modern day crucifixion for this incarnation. Um, finally, the ultimate destination, or the alternate destination, would be the dream of where the Daddy God Art Museum would be situated south of Mayer Center on the road to Charleston. It would be situated with the ocean front on one side and backed by the beautiful local salt marshes on the other. Anyone wanting to visit historic Charleston for the day can stop at the museum for a couple of hours on the drive down. Here I want to show you a few recent paintings that I have created for the museum. I think I have about 30 done so far, but I plan many, many dozens more. These are very elaborate and time-consuming paintings done with oil on canvas in a very large format size of five foot by seven foot. So you can see these are too big for private homes. These paintings are currently being created and housed at my studio, which is just 15 minutes north of Mayer Center in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I would like to extend an open invitation to anyone visiting the area to stop by my studio for a short visit for a cup of chai and to see the current artwork. Visiting hours are from noon to 6 p.m. and I'm here seven days a week. Also, here you can see a few of my true life short story books about Mayor Baba. These books have been printed and published and are available on Amazon. I'm very excited to tell you about another huge project I'm working on in my studio. I'm very excited about this one and I think you will be too. With the help of a few animators, I am working on full feature film link Walt Disney style animated movies of Meher Baba done in my Woden style of depicting his image. Currently, we are creating a five minute presentation sample of what the full length movie might look like. We plan to use this mini presentation to show our proposed film to the public when we are asking for financial donations to pay the animators. Animation is a very labor intensive and time consuming endeavor and the animation staff must be paid in order to live and be able to afford to work on this project. Finally, I would like to invite anyone who feels inclined to support the vision of the Daddy God Art Museum as well as the animated movies to donate financially. It will take a few million dollars in my estimation to build this museum as I envision it and to finance its operation and maintenance for the next few hundred years. I would also like to suggest that people leave donations for the museum in their will. Information on how you can donate is provided in the section below this video. You can send donations now to my PayPal account, which is wodenart at aol.com. That's w-o-d-i-n-a-r-t at aol.com. From time to time, I might set up GoFundMe style accounts where you can donate, and eventually I will also create a tax exempt foundation where you can make larger donations that will be tax free. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I apologize for the sound of all the motorcycles out here. It's bike week in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which happens every, every May and September, I think, and it gets very loud here. Yeah. And also my parrot over here keeps peeking in once in a while. So I apologize for the noise. Um, I hope you'll return in the future to see more videos that I intend to create telling more true life real adventures with Maker Baba that the world is yet to hear. So bye bye for now. See you later.